So our next speaker and the last for today comes from the Netherlands and uh, he's in the IT within the uh, 1990s. He has started with IBM and uh, later on uh, he goes with uh, security and uh, ethical hacking. He has been consulting uh, different uh, personalities, countries, companies, NGOs, and he is also a co-author of a book uh, that is about internet security for journalists. So, uh, at the moment, he is lead advisor at Brunel Information Security. And, ladies and gentlemen, Ariane Campos. Thanks. Good afternoon, all. Happy you all stayed. Um, I'm between you and dinner, so I'll keep this fairly short, and there's time for Q&A at the end. Also, on the last slide, there is a link to all these slides, which you can all download if you want. So there's no need to take pictures of the slides or anything like that. Um, I do information security work for uh, Brunel, which is a big engineering company. I have a couple of tens of thousands plus colleagues all over the world. Um, this is our sailboat. We use it to have offline conversations with our IT clients about IT security stuff, and in a minute you'll see why. So, um, some of you here may be like me, old enough to remember the time when you could get on board an airplane without being treated like a criminal for 45 minutes, uh, when you could keep your shoes on and bring a, you know, something to drink, and, you know, the glory days of the 1990s. And over the last 15 years, the world has gone very funny in a rather weird way, and that goes into what I want to talk about today is... Um, a lot of the spying going on and what we can what we can do about it. So, um, information security topics are in the news a lot. Usually, people use the word cyber for that. It, it doesn't really mean anything anymore. The word, which is why it's so useful to just put cyber in front of any, anything, and that way you can sell more crap or get more budget for your department or whatever. But it doesn't really mean anything. Um, but in all those discussions, it tends to be about what I call the small stuff. So criminals, um, uh, DDoS attacks, stuff like that, which is actually, you know, maybe not even the most important stuff, but it's the stuff that everybody talks about because we have some sense that there are solutions for it. Um, but in most of the discussions I see um, uh, about information security and, and data privacy and those kinds of things, there's a giant elephant in the room that is often, certainly in Western Europe at least, uh, is not talked about, is... What we've learned from Mr. Snowden is that everybody's spying, uh, but some countries are more than others, and some countries a lot. Um, and we don't really talk about that, the fact that most of these so-called cyber criminals are actually governments, and some of them are our own governments, but many of them are foreign governments. Um, so the crazy thing is that actually, when the Snowden documents came out, it was just a confirmation of something that was known in information security circles for at least... 13 to 14 years before that. So there were already fairly detailed analysis made in the late 1990s by some really good investigative journalists on the kind of spying that in particularly the NSA was doing against European other countries, against European companies, against European political institutions, journalists, individuals, and so forth. Um, but we never really did anything with that. So we, we sort of knew, but then it was inconvenient to know. And there was a, a very good report in 2001 uh, written for the European Parliament that actually mentioned all the good ideas about what you could do about this. So it said, okay, teach everybody how to encrypt communications, like start teaching people when they're in school at age 13 or 14, why not? Teach them all to do encrypted email and use only open source crypto libraries so you can verify that it you know, doesn't have any back doors. And so the report, and so this is a 15-year-old report now, it said all the right things. Um, but yeah, it came out in July 2001, um, and then it was going to be, and then everybody went on holiday in August, and of course in September, the European Parliament was going to debate the report, and then something else happened in September 2001, you might remember. Um, and so then the report went into a drawer, and it didn't come out again until Edward Snowden got on, a air, got on an airplane to Hong Kong with a USB stick with a whole bunch of documents. Um, so certain uh, parliaments, including the Dutch one that I've uh, consulted on and the UK and the German one, have worked on uh, um, 
implementing more open source in their in their government systems and processes, but it hasn't really gone you know anywhere significantly. So everybody's sort of beginning to do some stuff, but it's really nowhere near what we'd like it to be and what it should be, despite us having known about this stuff for 15 years. So that's kind of weird. So is it competence? Are they corrupt? There's questions about why our governments are still buying American spyware with our tax money when they could be using free software, which is both free as in it doesn't cost any money, but also much more importantly, it's free as in freedom. Um, so I'm currently working with some journalists to try to figure out why that is. So for those who don't speak a lot of German, uh, the girl asks, my daddy says you can look into my computer. And Obama answers, that's not your daddy. Um, which sort of sums up what the NSA does. Because if it's true that the person that is registered as her father in some you know, government administrative system is actually biologically not her father, which you could conclude from a medical file on some other computer, then that's the kind of information that the NSA wants to have. Not necessarily because her father is a terrorist, but maybe in 10 years he'll be the new finance minister from Germany. And if he has a daughter who's not his daughter, that's useful information to have if you're you know, in Geneva on a big table and doing negotiations on some trade thing about car imports or something like that. Um, so most of the work of the NSA, in fact, I would say pretty much all of the work of the NSA these days, is not about counterterrorism because they don't catch terrorists. They have not caught anyone in the last 15 years, despite spending the kind of money that is usually the gross national product of a country on spying on everybody, they haven't caught a single terrorist, so you have to wonder, are you even trying? Now, thanks to Snowden, we have a lot more insight, and um, uh, shortly after Snowden, uh, a recently retired uh, uh, commander from the Dutch, or sorry, the German uh, security services came out and said, yeah, look, look, all the spying stuff we do, it's not about catching terrorists, it's about industrial espionage. Um, and, and, and he even said, we are sometimes forced by the Americans to spy on the French parts of Airbus to then give it to Boeing, and that sort of stuff. So that was a, a rare little insight into sort of how the grown-up world really, really works, and it's, yeah, it's, so it's not about them terrorists. Um, but it's not just Airbus and Siemens and the really big, well-known, you know, gazillion euro companies that are being spied on. It's even much smaller companies. And again, thanks to WikiLeaks and Snowden, we now know a lot more about that. So all this stuff is now no longer controversial because we have the documentary proof from the people doing it. And it, this is, you know, the NSA is a big organization. They talk to each other in memos and PowerPoints. And we now have many of those memos and PowerPoints. So it's no longer controversial that this is going on. The only real discussion is, are we going to just take it? Are we going to let them rob us blind in Europe, or are we going to do something about it? So that's what most of my talk is about. So again, you know, all kinds of political espionage, and none of this, this is making us safer. It's making us probably unsafer, if anything. Um, so the NSA uh, looks at all kinds of stuff. This is an actual NSA building. I didn't make this up. It's just a crazy photo. Um, so one of the things they track is people's porn surfing habits. Because um, that's a good way to pressure people. So if you've ever looked at some interesting pictures on the interweb, and maybe later you become a journalist of some renown, and you're making life difficult for some NATO country, then this would be one of the many ways that they can put pressure on you, by, by threatening to release that information to everybody you know, and then some other people. Um, so again, very obviously, this has nothing to do with fighting terrorism. This is just political manipulation. Um, so the European uh, Court for Human Rights has concluded that uh, all this cloud computing stuff, with, with all the stuff we now know about American espionage, putting people's data in Europe on Amazon servers or on Google servers, just is a really bad idea, and also not in line with the European uh, laws about uh, our right to privacy. So the cloud, comp yeah, there is no cloud. I mean, cloud technology is great, you know, virtualized machines based on open source stack, so that's all cool. Just make sure they're you know, close to you and not in some faraway country under a different legal regime where you have no control. Uh, because it's just somebody else's computer that you're borrowing and you have very little control over it. And that's a, that's a real problem. So um, the NSA calls this, so this is an NSA slide. I didn't make this, so I take no blame for their 1990s graphics. Um, you would think that an organization with you know a uh, hundred billion dollar a year budget would make better slides, but for some reason they can't. Um, so they call it strategic partnerships. Of course, from the perspective, if you're not an American, it's really more like betraying your customers. So 80 major global corporations, among the one that you see here, 
in pictures, um, all their uh, products and services, I mean, we're talking about a lot of hardware here, but also software and also, of course, services on top of those, they're all backdoored when they come out of the box. So whether it's you know a Windows operating system or an IBM mainframe or an Oracle database platforms or Cisco hardware, all of that stuff is backdoored out of the box, which means that you can try to secure it, and you know if you're clever and you have a good team and you work hard and you do everything right and you also have a lot of discipline, you can probably secure it against like not so smart script kiddies and maybe some criminals, but as soon as you know a U.S.-based three-letter agency wants in there, there's really nothing you can do because they just have like magic passwords that are built into hardware and, and you can't really defend against that. Or, or even know if they're trying. Because the system itself will misinform you about what other people are doing on that system that you think is your system. It's really not your system, you're just using it and you're paying for it. But it's the NSA system and it's sitting in your parliament or your hospital or your factory or whatever. So if in Europe we want to be a little bit independent and be in charge of our own societies, which is why we have this democracy thing and stuff like that, then all of this needs to go. Because we cannot run our society and be in charge of it if the entire information infrastructure, which ties into everything these days, right? I mean, switch that off, switch this, switch all this stuff off and your society just falls apart. People can't do payments anymore. The power will probably go off because of all the industrial automation stuff. Um, so all of this needs to go, it needs to be replaced with the kind of things that we're talking about here, open source, both software and hardware, that we can control, that we can audit, that other people can audit if they don't necessarily want to trust us, so that we have systems that we are actually in charge of. Now that's a big job, but it's also a big opportunity. So we're spending a lot of money buying this stuff and all this money could stay in Europe providing jobs here. Right now the money is leaving, so I'll get back to that in a bit. So. With the software, it was obvious that it was happening, um, but it's also the hardware. So, uh, for instance, we now know in uh, a lot of detail that all the post-2009 Intel x86 chips, they all have a remote management module, which sounds really great if you're a company that has 50,000 laptops, you can remotely administer them. The problem is that the NSA can also remotely administer them. So, so if you're a journalist and you're doing an interesting story that, you know, that that's not, that's not a lot of fun. And, and bad things might happen to your sources, for instance, if their identities get found out. Um, so we have backdoors in you know, all this stuff. Um, Windows 8, um, and this was an example with Apple, but it's probably true for most other proprietary uh, uh, um, software, uh, devices with software on them, um, that the Department of Justice says, look, uh, the software on your phone if you have an iPhone, is not yours. You license it, so you, you pay for it, but it's not yours. You merely license its use. And because it's not yours, but because it's still Apple software, and Apple is an American company, therefore your phone, at least the software bit of it, is American territory, and American counterterrorism laws, the Patriot Act and its little sisters, apply. Which means that we, as an American government, can just go into your phone and do whatever the hell we want. And of course, technically, there's no way for you to know because an iPhone doesn't have an off switch. I mean, there's, a, there's an icon that switches off the screen, but the phone is never off. You cannot remove the battery. So what's it doing with the microphone array? What's it's is it looking through the cameras? You wouldn't know. I mean, the green light can't, doesn't come on. It doesn't mean that the light going into the camera isn't going anywhere. Right? Pretty hard to know. So this is a problem. Now, all of that's bad enough, uh, but then somebody in America about eight years ago thought it was a good idea to do a full-scale cyber war thing. Um, so they developed a Stuxnet virus and designed it to attack the Iranian nuclear installation in Natanz, which was a civilian installation, which was being monitored by the International Atomic Energy Agency. That was you know, not in breach of any rules, certainly not more than all kinds of other installations in other countries. Yet the US thought we're going to do a, a military-style attack on a civilian target in a country that we're not at war with, that's not threatening us, which is kind of a breach of a giant stack of laws, but they did it anyway. Um, so the problem, of course, is that the virus escaped into the wild and attacked all lots of other stuff that it wasn't supposed to attack, but you know, accidents happen with weapons if you spread them around, we all know that. Um, so lots of countries now have this piece of software, which is a very cleverly written piece of software. It's really top-notch design and programming. 
uh, they spent millions and millions developing it and some really smart people worked on it. Um, but so a few things happened. A, the Iranians figured out that they were being attacked by America through digital means. So then they started recruiting hackers as well to basically, you know, bite back a bit. And we've had some weird accidents in Western nuclear installations since then, and that might have been the Iranians, we don't know for sure. Um, other things have happened. But also all the other countries in the world, all the other non-Western countries have said, oh, okay, digital warfare, including towards countries that we're not at war with, apparently is now a thing that we do. Because NATO is doing it. Well, if NATO does it, then everybody can do it, right? So now China and, um, and Russia and, and India and Pakistan and Brazil and everybody is now building digital weapons and is willing and able to use them even outside the context of war against civilian infrastructures doing maybe possibly terrible things. And the West, of course, particularly America when their little partner Israel, has given the world a very top-notch weapon that is easy to copy. So you would think that after 30 or 40 years of completely messing up the Middle East, we would have learned that it's a bad idea to you know, throw weapons around in places where other people can pick them up and reuse them. But of course, we took a digital weapon, which is even cheaper to copy, as opposed to tanks and aircraft carriers and even guns. And so we gave it to the entire world. And now so the entire world has a weapon that is designed to take down or manipulate industrial infrastructure that runs on Siemens industrial controllers. Now guess where most of the Siemens industrial controllers are? They are of course in the West. They're in Western Europe, they're in North America. So those countries are most highly automated, most vulnerable, and the US has just given a weapon to the world to take that out. So that was not very clever. Um, I think that's an understatement. Um, and, and some of the Stuxnet stuff is gonna come back to certainly North America and some of its Western European allies. Um, now, if you do everything right with your laptop, you do all the crypto right and you take care of it and you've taken it offline and you've taken out the Bluetooth and it's completely disconnected from all the networks, there is still a group within NSA that can get into that if you are individually targeted or you're part of a group that's being targeted. They're called tailored, ac tailored access operations and they have a whole suite of very advanced science fiction-like tools that actually work, we now know. Um, to get into online, offline systems, systems that are, for instance, underground in a bunker in Iran or something like that. So the cotton mouth um, uh, chip, you can Google the ANT product data, there's much more uh, information online about this. Uh, the cotton mouth chip is just one of those chips that um, uh, is very small, it's a tenth of a millimeter thick and it fits inside the plastic casing of a USB uh, plug, so it's the little orange squarey thing you see at the bottom of the USB plug. Um, and they're fairly expensive, but not you know, to, I mean, not like a jet fighter, but I mean, it's not like a sense. It's more like thousands of dollars a pop. Um, and, but you can hide them inside other pieces of electronics. They require very little power. And if a USB plug with this chip built into it, which is no, not in every USB plug, just in some, um, goes into an offline computer, then suddenly that computer will receive a virus, probably at the BIOS level, or possibly at the OS level. Um, and it starts uh, signaling back to the USB port all the keystrokes which means your passwords. And then the chip can act as a radio transmitting device, transmitting that information as a radio signal. Now we don't know the range of that, it could be kilometers, could be tens of kilometers, we don't know. Um, depends also on the size of the antenna on the other end. Um, but there are indications that at least tens of kilometers is a, is a very um, a normal range for this kind of stuff. Now how does that chip, which doesn't, is not in every USB plug in the world, get into, into that one place where, you know, with your computer in your super secret space? Well, somebody close to you, or maybe you yourself, bought, for instance, a printer or a scanner or something with a USB plug online, and they didn't hide their identity. And so somebody, including Amazon, and therefore including the NSA, knew that that one box was gonna go from the Amazon warehouse through the postal system to your place of residence or your place of work. And then at three in the morning in the central post distribution office, a CIA special operations team opens up the box and adds all these kinds of things. It might be extra firmware in the device, it might be extra hardware, all kinds of stuff. They might reconfigure things before you receive them and then they reclose the box again and the stuff goes off and it ends up in your work or home or office or your parliament or anywhere. Now, this is actually also a photo from the Snowden cache. It's part of a manual that the CIA wrote for its contractors on how to do these kinds of operations. Now, the fact that they wrote a manual is a strong suggestion that it's not something that happens once a year. 
right? Why do you write a detailed manual? Because you're doing something every day. You need to train hundreds of people. I've written manuals. I know how this works. This is how that works. So this, has happened, this happens on a large scale. We don't know exactly what scale, but it's not like once a year. It's a lot more than that. So thanks to Snowden, we now know all this for a fact. Because, of course, before Snowden, we could only really speculate. We had some information. There were some other whistleblowers out of NSA before Snowden, like Bill Binney and Tom Drake. But they hadn't brought the documentary proof. Um, which is also why they can still walk around the US and, you know, be alive. And Snowden can probably never go back. Um, but before Snowden, if you talked about this stuff, and even if you had reasonable suspicions, you were called a little bit crazy. I speak from experience. Um, now, it's a little bit different. But still, most people won't want to accept this because, of course, the political implications are so bad. Now, the problem with all this technology that has been exposed... Um, is that it tends to democratize, meaning at some point one country has a new weapon, whether it's a nuclear weapon or a digital weapon, and then by exposing that, you give other people the idea that, oh, this is something you can build, it's possible, because somebody already did it. And then the second person building it just needs to copy what the first person did, and so it's a lot easier. So, you know, the Russians took less effort building their first nuclear weapon than the Americans did who had to invent all the stuff. So this picture, of course, 25 years ago was super secret, now it's just on Wikipedia. This is like a later generation nuclear weapon. It's much more advanced than the earlier ones. Um, so the NSA builds these kinds of weapons and then leaves them lying around on servers that other people hack into, and then they get loose on the internet. So last summer, a very advanced hacking suite for Cisco hardware was leaked on the internet, supposedly a small part of a much larger cast that is still sort of out there, and there are rumors that people are trying to sell this stuff. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the Cisco sort of malware hacking suite that was out there was really, really dangerous stuff if you were dependent on Cisco hardware. And a lot of people I knew had a you know, couple of very long overwork weekends to fix all kind of stuff or to try to unplug devices that were now completely insecure. So probably we're going to have more of this kind of crap in the future, which is again a good reason to abandon all this American, you know, completely unreliable stuff. Now, of course, meanwhile, we're st sticking computers into everything, and like cars, for instance, um, and the cars are now receiving over-the-air software updates and, and, and from America. So you can think of like six or seven different levels of things where we go, because while you're driving, I mean, really, because we all know that software updates never crash the system, right? I mean, it, it's, there's always a 100% chance it works. So, uh, yeah, exactly. Well, it, so now you can plug your Ethernet cable in from C 67C on a transatlantic flight, if you have the right airline. And, and the Ethernet port is physically connected to the main physical network of the plane. Because it's one physical network. Because why would you put two Ethernet cables into a plane where you can just do one and then do everything software defined? Because one Ethernet cable is lighter than two. So most of these planes have a single physical network that carries everything from Disney videos for your daughter to the management of the engines and the fuel pumps. And so somebody actually demonstrated that by taking a piece of Ethernet cable with him in his hand luggage, plugging in and taking over the engines on a flight. Um, he did that after writing to Boeing and Airbus that this was a problem and they didn't believe him, so he decided to make a demonstration of it. Of course, on the other end, there were some FBI people waiting for him when the plane landed because people don't like when you make planes go like that. This is, like, annoying. So what we have to do in Europe, I think, knowing all this stuff, that it's either already here or it's coming, with, with massive problems for our societies and massive risks to our economy and to you know, just the lives of, of the people around us, is we have to do two things. Um, one, all the stuff we already have, secure it as good as possible. So in Europe, we need about a million more people who are capable of doing that. Um, literally, we thousands and I could use like 50 more colleagues with IT security skills and, and we'd have a job for them like next week. This is crazy. Um, in all of Europe, many, many, many more. Um, so just try to fix the stuff we have as good as possible. But there's a hard limit to what we can do because as soon as your opponent is advanced, none of that really means anything. So while we're doing that, and hopefully learning some general more stuff about good information security in the process, we also really need to develop a completely new technology stack from the silicon up. So with software, we already have most of the stuff, right? You can already think of software architectures based entirely on open source. 
um, that do most of the things that most organizations need. There are still some niches out there where you can't find a turnkey open source alternative, like very advanced AutoCAD workstations, just to name a simple example, uh, and, and then some very specific market applications, maybe, uh, verticals. But for most of the generic infrastructure things, everything is already there. Um, but it needs to be maybe refactored a bit so that we can recompile it for a different chipset than an Intel x86, which is what now runs pretty much the world. And we might want to move away from that if we know that all the Intel x86 chips are backdoored and are undefensible. So that means that a lot of stuff will be new. A lot of stuff will actually be stuff we already have, but you know, slightly recompiled for another chip architecture, which is, you know, is some work, but it's not rocket science. We know how to do it. And then, of course, we have to make sure that the servers are you know, close to us, preferably in your city or in your country, maybe in the country next door if it's an EU country and you share some laws and regulatory frameworks, and maybe that can be good. But, but closer to you generally is better. So it's a giant job, which some people consider to be a problem. I consider it to be a massive opportunity. So currently, Europe is spending about $250 billion a year on buying American spy technology and bringing it into our most secret places, like our parliaments and our industries and our research and development departments and all those kinds of things. Then the result of that is another something like 200 billion a year worth of espionage against those very companies that have just bought this foreign crap. So what if we were to just stop doing that? then A, we immediately start saving 250 billion a year, and over time, we reduce the other 200 billion and by a significant amount. Now, you divide that by whatever number, what it costs in your country to employ somebody at a nice salary, plus an office and a laptop and maybe a car, and that's the number of jobs you can generate in Europe for people. And uh, that, you know, this is millions of jobs. So suddenly, we're not spending more money on IT than we're already spending today, we just have th three or four million extra people in Europe doing cool stuff for us. Oh, by the way, all the software they write becomes open source, so then other people can build on top of it. So now our whole innovation system becomes m much better. And it's terrible for the stockholders of Oracle and Microsoft, but then again, seriously, this is Europe. Who gives a shit, right? I mean, unless there's any, any Oracle stockholders in the room, I'm sorry. But for all the other normal people, most of us, seriously, who, who gives a shit? So the IT architectures of the near future will have three zones, and then hopefully we'll collapse them into one zone again in the future. We'll have the internet, fundamentally unsecure. Anything that goes on the internet that isn't encrypted, you have to assume that now it's in the hands of a dozen other parties. That's just, you know, if it goes out your network port onto the internet, you haven't encrypted it properly, it's out there. Assume that. That's, that's the good thing. So that's the wildlands out of the city wall. Well, then there's your walled city, but, you know, you see there are the two gates, right? So there's a web server and a mail server, and that stuff goes out, stuff can come in. You can never really defend it. If, if the attacker really is you know, advanced and clever and takes the time, and by the way, they are the Chinese army, so you can't go and arrest them, even if you catch them red-handed. I mean, what are you going to do? They're the Chinese army. They have nuclear weapons. What? Nothing. Um, so yes, you can defend the city to a certain level, but you can never really perfectly secure it. It's too big, it's too complex, and by the way, most of the technology now is fundamentally insecure. So within your bigger IT space, create a smaller subspace that you can defend by keeping it small, by training the people there very well in understanding what they're doing, and by using only very select hardware. So hardware you can trust, like pre-2009 Intel chips, um, a Tails operating system running on a core boot BIOS, stuff like that. We know how to build those kinds of laptops. It's, it's a bit of work. It takes a bit of practice for non-techies to work with it, but it's all doable. I've trained many journalists on using this kind of stuff. Most of them are completely not technical, and they can all learn to use this in a couple of days. It's not rocket science. So this is a doable thing. And we know that it works. If you use encryption properly, and if your platform isn't broken, and if your hardware isn't leaking, then encryption works. So we just need to get the stuff underneath the encryption to also be secure, and then we can you know, have private conversations again without six million Americans with a security clearance listening in on, on everything we do, which is annoying. The encryption itself is good, it's just that all the stuff around it right now is crap, and, and that's a fixable problem, and fixing the problem is a 250 billion a year business opportunity for European IT companies. So I think there, somebody there could have some fun with that. We just need to have the courage to do it and also have the political courage to tell you know, some American companies to go screw themselves and just 
stop buying their stuff, just boycott them, basically. So if you're building IT systems, and the IT system collects lots of information, you need to consider whether you can protect that information. And if there you have doubts, and this is information about people, you need to really have a good discussion with your colleagues about whether you should be collecting that information in the first place. So I think you know, if you can protect it, don't collect it, that's a good base rule for any systems architecture, particularly when you're talking about the information about people. I mean, other things, you know, maybe less bad, generally speaking, although if it's you know, financially sensitive data, then it can also be very, uh, very bad. Um, but especially under the new EU privacy regulations, you need to be very, very careful how you handle private personal data of human beings, particularly European human beings. So, as I said before, this stuff isn't going to go away soon. Um, we have an entire IT ecosystem in Europe. We have trillions invested into it, literally. We've literally spent a trillion euros as Europe on US spying software since 9-11. Um, so, you can't replace that overnight. But certainly, you can replace it all within a decade, right? I mean, a decade ago, we didn't even have the kind of smartphones we now have. I mean, we had smartphones, but they were like Nokia things with, with keyboards. So we have an entire new ecosystem that grew up in, in less than 10 years. So certainly within 10 years, we can replace that with something else again, with another chipset, with another operating system, with another application stack on top. And certainly if we can spend 250 billion a year on that, I'm sure you could you know, do some serious programming for that kind of money. So it's a doable project and it's a business opportunity. So um, it was uh, said earlier in the announcement already, I wrote this book. This is written for non-technical people in English. Um, it's Creative Commons licensed on the internet, so you can download it for free, you can reuse it for free, you don't need my permission. It's nice if you mention the names of the two original authors. Silky actually did most of the writing. Um, uh, but it's free out there for reuse, so you can take a chapter and send it to somebody, uh, or just download the whole, the whole book as an ebook and send it to them. And so this is meant as like a crypto party in a book, for non-technical people can learn in a weekend how to set up their laptop securely, how to encrypt their mail, how to encrypt files, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I think we're going to do a crypto party tomorrow. So if other people are here who want to learn, if you know people who want to learn, then come by tomorrow and we'll do some teaching. Um, if people want to do something with this book here in Bulgaria, for instance, make a kid's version for school, please do and please let me know and maybe I can find some resources to help you with that. Um, so the reason why I'm mostly doing IT security right now because I think it's the most important thing right now to get right. I mean, there's other stuff too, like climate change, but I'm not a climate physicist, so this is my thing. Um, and I think it's really, really important that we get this right, because if we don't get this right, if all our doctors, our lawyers, our politicians cannot keep a secret from a bunch of big foreign countries, then we're probably not democracies anymore. We may have still have the rituals of elections, but all our politicians have also watched porn online, probably maybe even more than the average person, I don't know. Um, politicians are a special breed of people, right? I think they are. Um, so they can all be, you know, manipulated. They can all be blackmailed. And so then how can they fight for our interests if they can't even defend themselves from, from little stuff? So getting this right really is economically vital, it's politically vital, and it determines of the kind of society we're going to have in Europe. So that's combined with the 250 billion euro business opportunity a year, you would think that, look, you know, Let's talk about this and not all the other stuff. That's my idea anyway. Um, so uh, next year, there's going to be another a big uh, Dutch hacker fest in the summer, first week of August, about an hour's drive from Amsterdam. And of course, you're all very, very welcome to not only come, but you're even more welcome to actively participate by doing a workshop or a talk or to volunteer for one of the many activities that we need. We expect between five and 6,000 people for a week to 10 days of uh, camping, but it will be glamping because we will have 100 megabit, uh, gigabit uh, fiber optic uh, to the field. Uh, so it's not like, you know, harsh out there. Um, and there's going to be a couple of hundred talks and a couple of hundred workshops and lots of other cool stuff. Um, and we're going to have the first harbor um, for sailing ships and stuff at a hacker camp. So if you want to go do a bit of sailing, we can do that as well. If you want to come by boat, have a boat with a not too deep a keel and you can do that as well. Um, and so you're all very welcome. If you uh, Google uh, SHA2017, you can find the site and uh, fill in the uh, call for participation. So please uh, come and uh, join us there as well. Um, so that's the link to all these um, pictures. 
I'm here the rest of the evening somewhere having dinner with a bunch of people, and I'm here all day tomorrow, including for the after party. So um, you can ask some questions, I think, now or later for the next 24 hours that I'm still here. Thanks for your attention. All right. So uh, you can use the boat mics in the middle of the room, and uh, you can also raise your hand and I'll come by you. And uh, if you allow me, until we get ready, I will start with the first question okay. myself. So uh, probably everyone knows that uh, CETA, CETA, the trade agreement yep. was uh, signed. So uh, what is your opinion on that and what impact do you think you will, it will have on the Europe IT world? It, it could be potentially dangerous because one of the things that is written into many of these new trade agreements, and they're not, they're not about trade, right? They're about the rights of investors. They're not about trade. Let that be that very clear. One of the things, it allows foreign companies to sue European governments if those European governments make laws that interfere with those foreign companies' ability to make money. No, really, and, and that tells you everything you need to know about these so-called trade agreements. Um, there was an Italian political thinker from the 1920s a guy called Benito, who had a phrase about the merger of state power and corporate power, and he called it fascism. Um, and I think that's a good description of what we're sort of up against here. And if you think of it in that way, then also, you know, you know what to do. Um, so I think these things are very, very dangerous. And I do think that also European governments that will do these kinds of things, which they should be doing, uh, yeah, they run the risk of being, uh, of being sued in a, some international weird court, corporatist, non-court court, um, for interfering with Microsoft or Oracle's ability to extract rent from you and me for using our computers. So this is a, this is a really a big problem. Um, and I think we're going to have a bit of fight over this, uh, over this stuff in Brussels, as, we, as we've had over the last 10 years. Yeah. Okay, my question is, uh, do you think that uh, decentralized systems, uh, let's say using uh, blockchain protocol as an example, can ensure security in some way? So um, that's my first question. For some things, it maybe can. It seems to me, looking at you know, Bitcoin, that uh, blockchain architectures do eat up an enormous amount of power and CPU cycles if, if you want to use it at scale in your society. Right? There have already been problems with blockchain because the processing speed wasn't enough to scale it up further. And already it requires a massive amount of power. So I think it's an interesting technology. I also think we're on the first iteration of it. And we've only really seen one real application. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm a bit worried if people want to slather blockchain magic sauce over every problem and think that the problems goes away. I, I think that's way too, too simplistic. Um, it doesn't really help, for instance, if all the servers running blockchain can all be automated hacked by the million because all their Intel CPUs are backdoored. So if you can manipulate you know, a computer at the CPU hardware level, then you can do crypto stuff on top of it till the cows come home. It doesn't really help. So it probably can be useful for some things. I, I actually still think we're looking for the best use cases. Um, but I think we should be wary. I think we should be careful with new technologies. I tend to be very conservative in what technology I use. I like PGP. It's been around for over two decades. And, you know, mathematicians have tried to break it for 20 plus years. They haven't succeeded. That gives me confidence that it's solid. With blockchain stuff, uh, I, I think we should do a bit more testing. That's basically my answer. OK, thank you. And uh, my other question is, uh, let's imagine that we live in a world where everything is encrypted, mm -hmm. let's say. Uh, but uh, we still have a bunch of metadata, data about the data itself. Do you think if we empower that metadata with, uh, not we, but let's say NSA, with some additional source of uh, ML or AI, do you think that uh, this is still da dangerous? Yes. Well, we, we know for a fact, uh, I mean, I know Bill Binney, the former technical director of NSA, who basically invented metadata and automated signal intelligence processing in, in the early 90s. Um, and he said that in most cases, yeah, they couldn't decrypt the stuff, and it actually had very little impact on their ability to assess what was going on. If you had all the metadata, you had most of the important stuff. So, yeah, we need to also have communications architecture that are less metadata leaky than, shall we say, email, which is, of course, a disaster in that respect. 
even though I like email very much, but that's one really big problem with email right now. So yeah, we're gonna have to come up with new messaging systems with all the good things of email, minus the giant metadata problem. So that's a, that's a bit of a challenge as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask you two questions. The first one is what is being done right now to help um, secure Europe, basically? Uh, are there any active movements? And then the second question is, you say that in every Intel x86 we have a backdoor. Um, well, are there NSA any... NSA documents say that, so I'm just quoting the NSA documents, literally. I'm yeah, not yeah, making yeah, this up. Yeah, no, yeah. The, the question is, uh, are there any hardware vendors that we can trust? Do we know any large, large-scale chip producers that we can trust? We have, we have some chip manufacturing companies and also companies that make machines to make chips in Europe. Uh, some of them are my clients, so I'm not going to name names if that's okay with you because we have fairly hard rules on that. But yeah, sure, we, we, have, we have all the, the companies with technical expertise in Europe, several of them in fact, to, to make other chips. Now, right now for them it's very hard to compete with somebody like Intel because they have the de facto sort of the market standard that all software is written to, software that is then often mandated by governments in the countries that they operate. So it's very hard for them to compete. If the government were to say, look, you know, we need something else and we're willing to pay for it, and you can actually charge us more per you know, MIP or whatever than the current Intel chip because we want security and so we don't care so much about the price for the short run. Now suddenly you have a business case. So, so I think technically, I mean, Europe is a 500 million people you know, economic block with high educational levels and you know, good infrastructure. So there's, there's nothing that we can't build if we choose to. It is mostly a political choice at this moment. But to your first question, nobody's really defending Europe right now. So um, governments usually actually are mostly part of the problem by, for instance, mandating Microsoft in schools as a, as a de facto platform. So b basically teaching all children, bringing them up on spyware. And, and to me, it's like the digital equivalent of, uh, you know, allowing a cigarette company to, to pass out cigarettes on a school square. Because you start making kids addicted to Microsoft crap from age five onwards, and then it's pretty hard to get them off it by, by the time they're 22. So you need to not start making them, you know, addicted, which is, again, addicted is a term that Bill Gates used in the 90s when he was asked about China and would they ever pay for software licenses. He said, oh, it's fine. We'll just allow it to be pirated now and then in the next century they'll be addicted to Microsoft and we'll make them pay. So again, I'm not making this up. This is just quoting other people. Um, so, so, but most of the real policies, problems at this point are policy problems. And I'm sure that if we make those choices as, as countries or as societies to go that way, that together we have all the technical skills and the companies and the machinery and everything's already there. And we, most of the software is already there. So once, once a bunch of people can actually work on this full time, I mean with a bunch, I mean like, you know, 100,000 people or something, we can do this very, very quickly, a couple of years and then we'll be there. Even, even the, the risk architecture from the European Space Agency, they have a really nice chip that is radiation hardened and the design is open source because Europeans paid for it with their tax money. So anybody can take that design and, and run with it. So it's already there. Thank you very much. All right. All right. I think we have one more question there. Or yeah. <coughs> you describe as a very interesting uh, future, Internet of Spy Things. Yes. Spy in everyone thing, <coughs> even in USB ports. But uh, why never no one present uh, real existing backdoor in Intel processor, Cisco router, or uh, Microsoft Windows. No, no one hacker, uh, nor Snowden, nor Russians, nor Russians with Snowden, no one. Why? No, 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 everybody knew. There, there, was, a, there was an article in a German IT magazine in 1999 that Windows XP was backdoored. So this has been known by experts for 15 years. The problem was always that if you told people, they would call you crazy. Because the implications were so vast that nobody wanted to deal with it. So the easiest way was to call people crazy. That was a good sort of denial solution to the problem. And, and it still is today, even, even though we have you know, the detailed technical documentary proof. Still, most people don't want to deal with it. So it's, it's much more a psychological denial problem than, than you know, tec technical understanding. Um, and that's the real, I mean, but usually, you know, the kind of mass psychological problems are the really hard ones. The technical stuff is comparatively easy. 
Um, so we've known all this for a long time. We now know it much more detailed. And really now we need to start doing something with that knowledge or yeah, we're all gonna be really badly screwed. I think one more question. Um, I see somebody standing at the mic. Unless we really have to go, but no, I'm no. happy, uh, I'm happy uh, to take one more question. Okay. Uh, so thank you for the great presentation. I think that Bulgaria is quite a good place for this because we are a very skeptical people. Uh, and as well, uh, we have a good tradition about stealing technology and creating the Apple took long named products here. So my question is, do you think, you, you said that open source software is doing a very good thing to save us from, uh, from spying and stuff like this, but you say that now the problem is in the hardware. Yep. Do you think that maybe the future is in starting to do the hardware on our own? Uh, in, well, in the future, I mean, you, you, open so, source hardware, yeah. So to make good CPUs is a, it's a, is a harder problem than making good software because it requires scale, right? So it's a, a, a high-end CPU manufacturing installation is a multi-billion euro investment that you need to do every two to three years because it ages very quickly. And so it requires a, a, a kind of scale that would be more fitting to do it as Europe. And then suddenly a couple of billion a year suddenly isn't a lot of money. But if you do it on your own as a small country, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's a much steeper hill to climb. I mean, if you succeed, of course, then you've got a wonderful export product. So, you know, please go and try. And if you succeed, I'll, I'll buy that chip and I'll be happy to pay like five times what I'm paying for my Intel CPU. I mean, really, seriously, I'm not kidding. So please go try or st start a project with a couple of people. Uh, but, I th but I think, you know, hardware manufacturing, especially things like core general CPUs, is very, very capital intensive as opposed to software engineering. Um, but I do think open source software, free software, I'm like a bit old school. Sorry, I, I know Richard Stallman personally as well. Um, he drills me every time I meet him, as he does. Um, I think free software really is the only way forward if we want to remain democracies and not essentially, a, a, you know, a colony of a foreign power which is which we, what we are becoming if we just allow foreign countries to, to dictate our stuff. Now, of course, Bulgaria also has a fairly proud history of kicking the pants of large empires that seem invincible at the time, as I remember from your history. So maybe, you know, you do that again. You take a couple of Intel CPUs to a bridge and destroy them, film the whole thing, and say, this is the start of the revolution or something. Revolution could begin here. I mean, you have really awesome IT people here. Uh, so there's no reason you could start. Again, you just need, you already have open source policies in your government. Maybe, you know, they need to be accelerated a bit, but you've got a very good start here. So yeah, why not go for it? And certainly saving a million in software licenses in this country creates more jobs than in say, Western Germany, right? Where the cost of living is, is, is triple or, or four times as high. So it's a very logical thing to do it here. I'm not, I don't know if you pay the same for software and maybe you get a discount or something. Um, but it would, see, it would seem very logical to start here. You've got, you got great IT people, you've got great, great programmers and you know, sysadmins, and you've got everything here. So yeah, you could just start. And, and, and start with public institutions because they're the most like, logical to do it. Schools, hospitals, government, you know, that kind of places. Energy infrastructure, all the important stuff. All right, so uh, the time is up. So the last question there, I'll come to you. Okay. Hey, um, I'm, I'm thinking about what, what you said. It's, is it really a technical issue or it's how the people think, right? Because you said a couple of times we can fight with that, but who, are, who is we? Is it the, the we, governments we, or the people? No, or the we, people motivated to be not in this shit? I think, I think the we means everybody who feels that they want to be part of fixing this. Yeah, but so that's that's that. So there's no tightly defined we. It's not like a, a members club or anything like that. Um, it's it's every every citizen who says I'm going to be, I'm going to donate my time and energy and talents, whatever they may be. You know, I'm not a programmer myself. Right? I I haven't coded in like seriously in like 16 years or whatever. Um, uh, but I I do other things like consulting work and writing articles. And so everybody can contribute to this problem. And and the we that I'm talking about is all the people who say. Okay, this is not good. I don't want to live my life in, 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 in my part of the world like this. I'm going to contribute to fixing it. And if we do that correctly, a lot of people might have, you know, uh, might end up having jobs because of it, which, which would be great because then they can keep doing it for 40 years, um, which is, you know, probably what's needed to keep doing it into the future a lot. Um, 
so, so, so the we is usually this kind of stuff doesn't happen because an individual politician understands this problem and takes a visionary thing. It's a bunch of citizens that said, look, this is what we need. And then hopefully at some point they can convince a politician to start supporting them instead of opposing them. But even before, there's already a lot of stuff you can do. In fact, most of the work that the open source community has done has been despite the complete lack of support from governments, right? So they were actually fixing major social problems in the world with complete absence of money and government support and companies. And the companies and the money, and that all came later, right? After we had developed PGP and the Apache web server and Linux and all the good stuff. Um, so also what I've learned from lobbying governments is never wait for permission. Never ask, you know, never ask permission, just start. And then, you know, if you mess up, then you just ask for forgiveness and usually it'll be fine. But just, but just start. And don't, don't wait for budget, don't wait for a mandate, don't wait for permission, because then you'll never start. But you can just start with everything you already have, and then if you're good, then at some point the money and the support will come. And it could be a lot of money. I mean, you know, Red Hat is a billion euro business, so there's certainly money to be made in this. We just have to figure out a way. All right. All right, so thank you. Let's thank everyone. One more time.